Uh, it is such a privilege and one of the things that I love most uh, to meet really, really interesting people doing great work who are asking similar questions, exploring the same sorts of things, um, and doing it in a totally different place, completely disconnected from us, but we're like on the same track, on the same journey. And I mentioned this last week, but so many of you have told me in conversation that one of the things, one of the things that is most helpful for you about who we are as a community is, is that you're finding more and more that the Jesus you're coming, the, the God you're coming to know in Jesus is so much better than the God that you were handed uh, growing up. And I, I, we just continue to discover this to be true. And so um, this morning we have a guest speaker with us. His name is John McMurray. And here's what you're supposed to say about John. Here's what you're supposed to say. John co-authored a book with Donald Miller, right? Donald Miller lived with John. John is friends with William Paul Young, who wrote The Shack. All that stuff that would make people go like, oh, okay, okay. But here's what you really need to know about John. If you sit with him at a table, around a meal, and get into conversation, it is the kind of conversation that will make you feel at home, it's the kind of conversation that will feel holy, and it's the kind of conversation that feels a little bit like somebody pulled a pin on a grenade and dropped it in your ear. Um, and just like in the best way possible, by the way. Um, so would you, would you do me a favor and uh, please give a warm Florida welcome to our friend John McMurray. I, uh, I always hesitate to speak after introductions like that because I'm not sure who he's talking about because I don't know that guy. Thank you. Thank you for having me. That's it. See you later. No. Oh, I'm kidding. Um, I grew up in Philadelphia, and so even though I live in Portland on the West Coast, um, or what we hear you back east calling the left coast. Um, or, do you know, anybody know what the motto of Portland is? It's close. What'd you say? Yeah, keep it weird. Keep Portland weird. And we're doing a great job. <laughs> so <clears throat> that's literally the motto of the city, which I don't know what that says. It says something though. Anyway, so growing up in Philadelphia, my sense of humor is very sarcastic. That's just the way everybody talks in Philadelphia. Anybody here from Philadelphia? Nobody? What? Okay, there we go. So am I, am I lying when I say that? No, that is... So it, it, don't take offense if I say something sarcastic toward you. That's a term of endearment from me, okay? I'm, that's, I'm being serious, because so, sometimes it slips and I, I just kind of revert back to the whole Philly thing. <clears throat> but we'll try not to do that this morning. Um, again, thank you so much for having me. It's a privilege to be here. It really is. It's an honor. I uh, first met um, the person who even told me that this exists, because you'd be like, well, Portland, Oregon, how did you know that Brick City Church in Ocala, Florida even exists? Um, well, Esther told me about this church because she had been looking for a church for years, and she goes, I found this church that's having the conversation that we're having. And I went, wow, that's amazing because I'm still looking for one. Um, no, I, I, did a, I, I was a part of a house church for the last nine years. And it just, we decided to stop literally last October, like five months ago. So I'm looking again. It's a little too far to commute, but... but I, I'm just, I've, I've heard about the conversation you're having, and I, I want to be a part of that conversation. Um, and so, thank you for giving me time to be able to maybe put some things on the table for us to, to discuss this morning. Um, <clears throat> I want to ask a question. My first question, I have a lot. My first question is, how does God want to be known? I'm assuming that God does want to be known. So you don't have to agree with that assumption, that's fine, 
but we're going to start there. We're going to start with the assumption that God wants to be known. How do you think he wants to be known? Anybody? Say that again. In power. power. Can you flesh that out for me a little bit? What do you mean by power? What do you mean by power? Okay, okay. Um, anybody else? That's great. A nice Thank guy. you. I'm sorry. A nice, guy. a nice guy. God wants to be known as a nice guy. I do too. <laughs> God and I have that in common. Creator. Creator. Love. Love. Started to get a little traction there. Started to roll. Anything else? Pardon? A relationship. relationship. God wants to be known in relationship. relationship. How about he wants to be known as a relationship? Would you okay with that one? Okay, good. Because I am too. We'll get to that in a second. Pardon? Father of all. all. Awesome. I didn't believe that for most of my life. I only believed that God was the father of those who had believed in him and accepted him as their father. And then I read Ephesians 4, and it said he's the father of everybody. And I went, "Ah, that wasn't in my Bible before. How did that get there? Okay, anything else? Those are all great answers, but I think I have a better one. You don't have to agree with me. It's okay. All right. This, is, this isn't school. There's no test at the end. I'm just going to tell you what I think it is. God wants to be known as a man, a particular man, and his name is Jesus. He's the beginning and the end of the story, folks. There's not a God behind Jesus' back. You know, God's not the Wizard of Oz behind the curtain pulling the strings of the way life should go. And he sends Jesus to be his PR guy. See, because you read the Old Testament and you think, okay, this is one angry, and you fill in the blank, talking about the deity. And Jesus comes to kind of smooth that over. No, he didn't. So it's it's not that I want to know God through Jesus. I want to know God as Jesus because Jesus is God. And there is no difference between He and the Father other than they're different persons. And things start to unravel when I say that. What do you mean by that? Well, let me back up for a second and tell you a little bit of my story. Um, I was raised in a home that was Christian. Um, my father uh, became a believer rather old. He was rather old in life. I won't tell you how old because that would send us into a tailspin. But anyway, he became a believer. And because his life was, in, in today's terms, my, my father was a party animal. Like literally, he told me the story once where he and his friends stole a train not a model train, a real train. I'm like, how do you do that? Like, how did you even know how to operate it? Oh, well, one of the guys, we stole the train. My dad was a train robber, literally a, not the robber of the stuff on the train, he just took the train. Well, because of that background, when he became a follower of Jesus, he became incredibly strict. I think it was there all along, but He didn't want his children to live the way he'd lived. He didn't want us to make the mistakes that he made. And I think every father and and mother has that wish. We look back on our lives, we see mistakes we've made, and we don't want that for our children. Well, he didn't either, and he thought the way to get around that was by being strict. He thought the way around that was control. Control me. Control my brother. Control my sister. And so our upbringing was very strict, and so we were made to go to church, as long as you live in this house, this is, this is a quote, as long as you live in this house, you go to church. 
That's what we do in this house. I, literally, I can hear his voice saying it, right? So I grew up going to church all my life. And as a young kid, probably, I don't even remember how old, five, maybe six. It wasn't my dad that told me about Jesus. It was my mom. There's an interesting thing going on there. My dad wanted control. My mom wanted to tell me about Jesus. So, and I don't have any chip on my shoulder against my dad, just so you know. My dad passed away. It was all good before he passed away, all right, with he and me. And, um, but my mom told me about Jesus, and I, a five-year-old, six-year-old, you believe your mom, right? You, don't, you trust what your mom says because your mom is like the greatest person in the world. Why would you not ever trust? See, see her time, you, did you hear that? Your mom is the greatest person. <laughs> But you do. So I did. And I really, truly did believe what my mom told me about Jesus. And so those remaining years on into junior high and senior high, I, I identified myself as someone who was a believer in Jesus. But if you'd asked me what, I, what God thought of me, the word that would have come to mind was disappointed. God was disappointed in me. And anyway, so through this background, I ended up having uh, an experience right before my senior year of high school. I became serious about my faith. I really wanted to follow Jesus, and I thought that meant going into the ministry. So I graduated from high school, and I went to Bible college for four years. And I had friends that literally asked me, why are you going to Bible college? What are you going to do? And in my Philadelphia humor, I would say, I'm going to be a Bible. (laughs) Because then it ended the conversation. I didn't have to answer them, right? Because I had no idea what I was going to do. I just wanted to study the Bible. So I did for four years, and I graduated. And then I became a youth pastor. And I was a youth pastor for four years because that's kind of what you do when you're 22 and you graduate with a Bible degree, right? That, and you work in a couple part-time jobs because the church can't pay the youth pastor enough money (laughs) to be the youth pastor. Uh, Sorry about that, but that's, that's where we were at, right? We met in a little fire hall. Which, again, for the kids was awesome because whenever there was a fire during church and the firemen came running and the trucks went out, like we stopped church and the kids stood and they were cheering and watching. It was awesome. So anyway, after a few years, the pastor of the church said, you really need to go to seminary and kicked me out in a loving way. He said, you need to go and get more education. And I said, why? Do you think I'm dumb? He said, no, you just need more education. So I did. And that's when I moved from Philadelphia to Portland, Oregon. It's a long trip. And I went to seminary in Portland, Oregon for three years. And I got my master's degree. So now, like, I know something. Right? No, I didn't. I thought I did, but I didn't. And um, anyway, so I, my, the reason I said all that was to tell you that as I'm what I want to share with you this morning, some of these things are things that I've heard since I can remember. But I didn't fully appreciate them. I didn't understand them. I still don't understand a lot of it. But I certainly became apathetic over years. Um, Living in Portland, we have a landmark out there. It's called Mount Hood. It's 11,230 feet. And it sits like a pyramid, very symmetrical in its shape. It's actually stunning. And one of the unique features of our city is that pretty much from just about anywhere in the city, if you look east, you can see Mount Hood. And when I first moved out there, I I would be like you from Florida because you're a flatlander you would be straining to see this incredible, gorgeous, beautiful mountain everywhere you go. And I, for some reason, I just really connected to natural beauty. I don't know why, but I did. And so I would go to the grocery store and come out of the parking lot, and I'd be looking for Mount Hood. I'd be driving down the interstate, and I'd be looking for Mount Hood. I'd come out of the movie theater, and I'd be looking for Mount Hood. I'd go to parties, I'd be looking for Mount Hood. I was always looking for Mount Hood. And then, like, after a few months or a few years, um, I became like all the other Portlanders. When someone would say, so where's Mount Hood? That's right over there. 
you know, and we go on our business and we do our stuff. And we become kind of jaded or just dull to this beauty that we're surrounded in. But I will say this for Portlanders, if you point that out to them, they're usually quick to go, you know, you're right, and they'll stop and they'll realize why they live there and why they love it so much because of this natural beauty. Well, that's how Jesus had become for me. You say the name Jesus and I was ready to go to sleep. I was ready to clock out on the back row because I'd been going to church all my life. This is, this is embarrassing, but just to tell you how apathetic I had become, when I was 17, this is going to date me, so if some of you will relate to this, most of you won't. There's a band that no longer exists called The Who, and still one of my favorite bands, by the way, but anyway... They came out with an album in 1970 called The Who, Live at Leeds. Anybody know the album? All right, somebody does. <laughs> anyway, I think it's one of the greatest live recorded albums ever. 1970, 50 years later, it's just unbelievable. Well, they did this version of a song called My Generation, which goes, hope I die before I get old. And it was 14 minutes and 27 seconds long. Okay? Pete Townsend liked to improvise. And I would sit in church, and I'd start the song in my head, and I'd look at my watch, and I'd do the whole song, and then I'd look at my watch when I got done to see how close I got to 14 minutes and 27 seconds. On the back row, Jesus was just not interesting to me. I'd heard it all my life. I was like the Portlander with Mount Hood. Just became apathetic. But that's not true anymore. Jesus has gripped me in a way that I can't prove. It's hard for me to articulate. It's hard for me to explain. But he's gripped me and he won't let go in a way that I am stunned. I really, to be honest with you, I am completely undone. He's just unraveling me down to the true me and who I really am and seeing who I am in him. And I am just completely blown away, staggered by the beauty of this person. Now, how did I get there? Well, that would be a longer story. And I wrote about it. <laughs> but, but let me tell you a couple things. So another question. You tell me, who do you think Jesus is? Sorry? Forgiver. Forgiver. Forgiver, okay. Thank you, good. A Sorry? A brother. A brother. Awesome. That's wisdom. Sorry? My friend. My friend. God in the flesh. That's a, that's a good theological answer, isn't it? It's great. I love that answer. Can I show you what I, what I thought God in the flesh means? So here's what, I, here's what I thought. Now, you have to understand, this is a guy who's been raised in Christianity. He's gone to Bible college for four years, served in ministry in a church, Went to graduate school, got his master's degree, served again in ministry, teaching at a Bible college, then again at a church. And this is what I think God in the flesh means. Let's say this is God. And when I say God, what I mean is Father, Son, and Spirit. God is a being who exists as a triune being. He's a being who exists as three persons. We'll get to that in a second because that's pretty important. I didn't think it was all of my life, but it is. So... I, I get the, 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 don't judge me on the merit of the illustration, okay? It's going to break down, I get it, but it, it'll, it'll make a point, I think, I hope, the point I want it to make. So what I thought of God becoming flesh, or God who took on flesh, if this, is, this cup is a human body, God poured himself into the human body and took on flesh. God indwelt a human body. 
And I thought that's what Jesus was. Well, have you ever seen the movie Invasion of the Body Snatchers? Because that's what I just described to you. God is the ultimate invasion of the body snatcher. But see, Jesus didn't take on a body. He didn't become a body. He became a human being. But if there's a human being already there, are there there like two beings in this body? He became a human being without ceasing to be God. He becomes human, completely, fully human. He's not like Superman, where when it got tough or someone gave him a really hard question, he runs into the phone booth and strips off his robe and there's the big red G for God and gives you the God answer. You know, that must have been exhausting, you know, going in and out of the phone booth a million times a day, right? Well, uh, yeah, you're tempted to sin, but I'm God, I won't sin. No, he's fully human. He feels and he's tempted, the scriptures tell me, just exactly like you and I are. He feels what you feel. He feels what I feel. He entered our darkness because that's where we live. We live in blindness. If you don't believe me, let's talk about what the world's like. How does it look out there? Sometimes it looks good. A lot of times it looks not so good. So he entered into our darkness. He didn't take on a human body like he's going to control the lips. Okay? He actually becomes human. Fully God, fully man, simultaneously in one person. Not two persons, just one. Now here's the thing that really begins to explode it. This this is like the the nitroglycerin to the whole thing. Was Jesus coming and taking on flesh, was it a temporary event for God? Did God become human? And now that he ascended back to heaven, he took it off like like a coat, like he's no longer human? If you remember the story in Acts when Stephen was stoned and he looks up to heaven, do you remember what he sees? He sees a human being, Jesus, standing at the right hand of the Father. Which tells me, I mean, it it could be metaphor, could be literal, I don't know. If I take it literal, then it would be kind of I wouldn't say conclusive, but it would sure lead me to believe that Jesus retains his humanity. So, I'm going to do something a little different. This is off the cuff. Sorry, Brad. (laughs) This just popped in my head, and I, I think it's a tap on the shoulder. So, what's your name? Josh. Josh, can I borrow you for a second? Come on up. And this is your wife? That's Diana. Diana, come on up. Thank you. And, okay. And let's get some. And what's your name? Haley. Haley? Come on, Haley. Did I say it right, Haley? Kaylee. Kaylee. Okay. I'm old. I can't hear real well. Okay, come on up. All three of you up on the stage. Okay. All right. So, uh, we're in the round, which is even better. Because, typically, can I have you just stand, like, side by side? That's great. There you go. Typically, when we think of God and we think of Trinity, we think three persons, okay? Father, Son, Spirit, okay? And I chose two women on purpose. I'll get to that in a second, okay? But we think of them this way, but they're, they're not like this, okay? I want you to turn and face each other. No, no, turn in, in a circle. We're in a circle. There you go. That's okay. There you go. Okay, if you've ever seen like the icons of the Greek Orthodox Church, the Trinity is always pictured in a circle because they're trying to depict for us the relationship that God is. They are absolutely, completely in love with each other. There is nothing more sacred, 
There is nothing more beautiful in the entire cosmos and beyond than this relationship. This is it. This is the source of anything and everything that you believe and find to be beautiful, right here. Do you believe that? I believe that with all my heart. Beauty doesn't reside somewhere outside of them, and somehow the earth was made beautiful. No, if the earth is beautiful, it was birthed out of the way they relate to one another. They love each other. And their love is incomparable. It staggers the imagination. Okay? So, I don't want to throw you too far in a loop. So, the sun, the eternal word, leaves. And I get that this, like, I, I don't know how this happens because he doesn't leave, but he does leave. And again, this is language for you and I to try and understand something that is inadequate. Because if somehow the eternal word ever was not related to the Father and Son, then God ceases to be God. That's another... Okay? But something happens. The eternal word, the eternal Son, takes on humanity. He becomes flesh. And He visits our planet. He's born. You celebrate this at Christmas, right? He lives, He dies, He rises, and then He ascends... And returns. This is what he says. He returns to the Father. We're going to read a verse here in just a second. It says he returns to the Father and the Spirit. Back to this fellowship. But what is he? He's different. Because when he returns, he returns as a human being. A man. Which means, this blows my mind, ladies and gentlemen. This means that in the very being of God, humanity resides forever. You, me, every human being that ever existed is right there because Jesus is right there. The man, Jesus, who is the man for all of humanity, is in the Trinity. He is part of the Trinity. He's not standing outside of it like this is God. God did something out here and then he took, threw it off and then came back into the Trinity as spirit or something. Humanity is now in this relationship. And there's only one human nature. And he took it. He became it. Fully human. Thanks, you guys. Appreciate it. But, but the, the, so this ch- begins to change for me the way that I, th- I thought about God and I thought about Jesus. And the verse I wanted you to take a look at, and if you have a Bible or if you don't, that doesn't matter. I can read it to you. Um, as soon as I pull it up, <laughs> is John 13, 1. Now, uh, to give you a, maybe just a really brief background, John 13, 1 is the beginning of a section of John. Okay, Because John, John wanted to write a, a narrative, a story. And he organized the story, and he wrote it a certain way, and he arranged it, organized it, in a way that conveys what he's trying to do, okay? So he selected certain things to put in the story, left a bunch of stuff out, and then he arranged the story. And in the story, when you get to chapter 13, it's the beginning of what we call the upper room narrative, or the upper room when Jesus spends this... Night. So here you have the story in John going on for 13, what in your Bibles would be 13 chapters. There's no, obviously, no chapters or verses when he wrote it. But for what we call 13 chapters, you have the story that covered from eternity (laughs) in verse 1 of chapter 1, all the way through when the eternal word becomes flesh, dwells among us, and then we start to learn about his life as a man. And then we get to this night, and John hits the brakes. And it slows down. Now, if you've seen movies do this, you're just not aware of it. If it's a good movie, you're just following along the story. But you, you cover years of time, and then all of a sudden, you spend a half an hour of the movie over a dinner conversation. Well, that's what John does. 
25% of his story is over a dinner conversation. John 13, 14, 15, and 16. 17 is where Jesus prays, which is the holiest of holy, all holy scripture, sacred texts there is, in my opinion. And this is how he begins. This is how John begins the story of the upper room. It was just before, verse 1, chapter 13, before the Passover festival. And Jesus knew that the hour had come for him to leave this world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. Now, that's called an editorial comment. Now, what I mean by that is, how many of you remember the show Magnum P.I.? Okay, some of you. Now, you know they're redoing it. They're rebooting it. Did you know that? Now, I don't know if they're going to do it the same way, but when they originally did it, the, the guy Magnum, Thomas, Tom Selleck was the guy who played Magnum, which my wife knows. That's why we watched it. So, <laughs> so, um, he was the narrator. So when you watched the show, you listened to Tom Selleck telling the story of whatever episode you're, you're watching. And the narrator... Magnum, Tom Selleck, as you're watching the story, he would fill in information for you that you needed to know in order to understand the scene that you were about to see. And then he'd stop narrating and you would just watch the scene. And this was done seamlessly. And this happens all the time in the movies. Okay? This was done seamlessly. Um, if you want to update it to something more modern, there's a show on Netflix, which I've never seen, called Narcos. And that was a lie. I've seen it. So, <laughs> and it's, it's narrated by one of the DEA agents. And then he stops narrating and you watch a scene. And then he'll narrate a little bit. But the narrator is filling in information for you. That's John. John, John is the narrator. And chapter 13, verse 1, is John narrating. He's filling in some information. You're not reading a conversation. You're not reading something that Jesus taught or a speech. You're not reading about a miracle. You're, John's just narrating. So we call this the editor or the narrator's comment. What he's doing is he's introducing for you the way that he sees the event that he's about to tell you about. And the event that he's about to tell you about is in the upper room where Jesus has his final meal with his best friends on the planet. And this is how John introduces that meal. I want you to hear it again. It was just before Passover, and Jesus knew that the hour had come for him to leave this world and return back to this. Having loved his own who were seated at the table with him, I think that's what his own are right there, who were in the world, he loved them to the end. Now that phrase, he loved them to the end, it's a difficult phrase to translate it. And some of your translations may even have done this. They'll say he loved them completely or he loved them to the fullest. Some translations translate that way. So here's the point. John's introducing for you the story he's going to tell you about this dinner, the Passover dinner in the upper room. And this is how he frames it. This is how you should read it. He reads it saying, this is what's going on. Jesus knows he's about to leave and he loves us. And what he wants to communicate to us at this dinner is how much he loves us. What he wants to communicate to us, what he wants us to know before he leaves, is you, ha you don't know, but I want you to know how fully, how completely, how I love you to the end. And that's how you should read the next four chapters. That this is all about John telling you that what Jesus is talking about, what he's really trying to communicate to us, is how much he loves us. Are you with me? Do you follow that so far? Does that make sense? I hope. Even if it doesn't, say yeah, it does. Okay. <laughs> Humor me. The first thing John tells you after he says this is Jesus takes his robe and he girds it up and he gets on his knees and he gets a basin of water. And he starts washing their feet. 
What's he doing? What's John telling you that he's doing? He's trying to tell you how much he loves you. And what's the first thing he does? He stoops beneath you to serve you. He doesn't stand up in here and say, well, I'm God and I'm more powerful than you. He stoops on his knees and he begins to wash their feet. Now, Jesus also said in several places, I don't do anything that I don't already see the Father doing. Let me repeat that because it's in John. I don't do anything that I don't already see the Father doing. So it's not like God the Father standing back here behind Jesus going, well, that's really good, son. That's good PR. Let them think that we want to serve them. But what it's really about is our power It's our authority, and if they don't buy in, we send them to hell. (laughs) We laugh because it scares us. I'm not laughing because that's the story that I was handed all my life, and I turned around and taught it as a Bible college prof for decades. I don't see anything. I don't do anything that I don't see the Father already doing. So if Jesus is on his knees washing your feet, what is the Father doing? He's doing it with Jesus. Jesus doesn't leave his relationship with the Father and Spirit back in heaven somewhere, and he's down here on his own doing reconnaissance. No. He brings the relationship with him. He can't ever not be in relationship with the Father and Son because the Because God is relationship. This is the being of God. This isn't relationship isn't something God takes on. It's not, it's not something he adds on. It's not something he decides to do. It's what he is. If the Father, if I had my Trinity back up here, they don't stand here and then behind them there's a deeper thing about God. The deepest thing about God is the three of them. And like I said, they are absolutely completely head over heels about each other. So when they birth creation, they don't birth creation because it's an experiment. And they don't birth creation because they're bored or they couldn't find what they wanted to do. This is the way I say it. The triune God who spoke the cosmos into being loves all that he has made. He does not continue to sustain its existence only to destroy it later. God wants to save it and us in it, especially us, for we are the ones who caused the ruin and destruction that we currently experience. God is working to renew, rebuild, and reconcile all things. His goodness exceeds our theology. His goodness exceeds our theology. God is better than you've ever imagined him to be. And when you think, you go, he's really good, he's better still. Now, is that not a God that you'd want to know? As good as I can think of you being, you're better? Well, I can think he's really pretty good. Yeah, but you'll never get there. His goodness has no limit. His love is relentless. It is unstoppable, inexorable. You can't stop it. And he loves you. And he loves me. And when he spun the cosmos into existence, when he spoke it into existence, he didn't do this because his plan was, well, I'm experimenting. This one I'm just going to destroy 90% of it. Because they they just didn't cut it. They just didn't measure it up. So, all of that to say, back to who is Jesus? He's God in the flesh. Third question. I've got four. How much time do I got and where's there a clock? Brad, tell me. Because it's 11. 11.06. Okay, how do I have to win? 11.15. 11.15? Okay. You're going to have to listen really fast. Okay. When Jesus 
when the eternal word, when the eternal son became flesh, did he become like Adam before the fall or did he become like Adam after the fall? Do you understand the question? When he takes on flesh, is it fallen human existence that he takes on, that he becomes? Or is it human existence before the fall? Well, up until historically, and you can check me out on this. Like, don't take my, don't take my word for anything I'm saying today. You check me out, okay? Not me, but what I'm saying, okay? <laughs> that was bad. That was just like, check me out. Like, no. Um, check out what I'm saying. But up until about, I would, I'm going to be generous. I'm going to say 500 years ago. That's, I think it's less than that. But up until about 500 years ago, the church, that is those who identified themselves as followers of Jesus, pretty much all believed that when God took on flesh, he took on fallen flesh. Because the unass- this is how it was stated. The unassumed, that is what God does not assume, is not healed. If he doesn't assume fallen humanity, he doesn't heal fallen humanity. And that's the way they thought and taught about it. So the idea that God took on flesh somehow before the fall is really a rather modern idea in like history term. Why is that important? Because I mentioned this earlier about 15, 20 minutes ago. Jesus has to, he doesn't have to, but he chose to heal us because that's actually the word for salvation. I don't know if you know that. Primarily, it means to deliver or heal. Sozo means to deliver or heal. And Peter actually says that in your English Bible. He says, the healing of your soul. This is our salvation, the healing of your soul. And so the way God heals us is not like a doctor who somehow externally operates on you and fixes something, and it all just remains on the external. That doesn't heal anything. If you as a man or a woman, struggle with pornography, to turn the computer off or your iPad or your phone or whatever media you use to watch it, if you stop watching it, that's a good thing. But that does nothing to change you. It does nothing to heal you. What has to be healed is the desire to turn it on in the first place. That's what has to be healed. And that's not an external thing. So God has to enter into the mess, the darkness. And he does. He goes down to the very bottom of our abyss. Because what happens at the cross? Well, that's as dark as it gets, folks. Is there anything darker? Is there anything deeper than hating your creator and then murdering him? That's it. And that's where he goes. Why? Because he's going to heal it. He's going to heal it from within. He heals it by becoming it and transforming it. And that's not an it. It happens to be you and me. It happens to be humanity. That's what he wants to do. He didn't create you to destroy you. He created you for a relationship. He created you out of the beauty and love that they are. That doesn't produce something like this. And he knew it. And yeah, it's a mess, but he has an answer for that. He has a solution for that. So who is this Jesus who comes to heal us? Well, he's God who takes on flesh, fallen flesh. So he knows, he really knows, because he's fully human, in your fallenness, he knows what betrayal feels like. He knows what it is to be tempted to lie to fake, but he doesn't do it. See, he does, he becomes flesh, but he, the writer of Hebrews tells us, but he doesn't sin. So I remember one time I was teaching a class on the book of John, and I asked people, when you pray, this, this is my fourth question, when you pray, and I just, I threw a lot out there because of, of time, so this is going to sound like, oh, you skipped a lot, I did, because <laughs> I go, where would you get this question from? Anyway, when you pray, what do you visualize? Anybody? 
Do you visualize anything when you pray? Okay, and what do you visualize when you visualize God? Okay. Okay, so it's hard because maybe you're struggling that there's no form or shape to God. So it's just, right? Yeah, because I don't want, yeah, exactly. I don't want what? Okay. Okay, so you reject that, yeah. right? Did you guys hear that over there? She rejects the image of God. Oh, you did. Okay, great. Okay. Okay, good. Anybody else? What do you visualize when you pray? Anything? Okay, for sake of time, I'll tell you what I visualized. My entire life, what I visualized was the throne room scene in Isaiah 6. That, to me, was the clearest picture of God. This is where you have this, you have God high and lifted up is, is the scene, and his robes fill the temple, whatever that means, but it means it's really big, and angels are swirling around um, I don't mean this in a bad way, but it almost was kind of like a Las Vegas night show, right? It's like wow factor. And they're covering their eyes with wings, and they're flying with other wings, and they're saying what? Anybody? Holy, holy, holy. Why do they say it three times? Because there's three persons. Thank you. And Isaiah sees this, and he says, I'm undone. I'm literally, in our modern translation, I'm becoming unglued. I'm losing it. I don't know what to do. And immediately he goes, I am a mess. I am, <laughs> right? When I prayed, this was how I visualized God. This high and lifted up, exalted, powerful, other, distant being. was the first thing I asked you this morning. How does God want to be known? He doesn't want to be known as Isaiah 6 version. He wants to be known as a man. He came to meet you face to face to win your heart. Here's what Hebrews 1.1 says. In the past, God spoke at various times and in various ways through the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken once and for all his best word, his final word, his only word, the Son. Because he is the exact representation of his being. Now, be careful with that phrase, because what I used to think when I heard that phrase was like Jesus was like a mirror. He's not the real deal, but he's the perfect reflection of God's being. No, that's not what the writer of Hebrews is trying to say. He doesn't have a mirror, or she doesn't have a mirror in mind, because I don't know who wrote Hebrews. But here's the thing. All my life, I had been thinking of God as Isaiah's version, and the writer of Hebrews says, John, it's time for you to lay that aside Because God has spoken finally, and his best word is the eternal word who became flesh, and his name is Jesus. That's who I want you to know me as. Face to face, man to woman, man to man, man to child, man to adult, human to human. So it's not us and them, it's just us. That's it. So, why does that all make a difference? Because this is why it makes a difference for me. My entire life, I thought and believed and taught that eternal life was like a transaction. So, it's kind of like this idea of going to heaven is you're not, you got to be good to get to heaven. You're not good enough. In fact, you have to be perfect and you're not perfect. So, Jesus comes and 
dies to pay for all the things you've done wrong, somehow wiping the slate clean so that you're now good enough to go to heaven. And if you'll accept that transaction, God makes a transaction with you and says, okay, here's eternal life. You get it. So you get to ride the glory train. You get to go to heaven. And that's, I literally, I, I said that gospel message to literally thousands of people in my life. And that's not an exaggeration. That's not patting myself on the back. I'm just telling you, that's what I believed. It's what I taught. It's what I said. It's how I shared my faith. It's how I went on mission. That was the good news. That's what God did. It was a transaction. You take it, it's done. Well, here's the thing. At the end of that upper room discourse in John 17, at the beginning of when Jesus begins to talk to the Father in his prayer, this is what he says. He says, now this is eternal life. That sounds like what's coming is going to be kind of like a definition. Now this is eternal life, that they know you and me whom you sent. So Jesus just defined eternal life in his prayer to the Father as knowing someone. It's not a transaction, it's a relationship. So how does God want to be known? Well, he doesn't want to be known as the great deal maker who says, I've done this for you, you take it, I'll give you this. But now in the fine print, this is how I want you to live, this is what I want you to do. And if you don't, then I, I curse you. If you do, I bless you. No. Someone said earlier this morning, I think of God as father of all. He's your father. And I remember when my son was born, my firstborn, and I looked at him for the first time. And instantaneously at that moment, there wasn't anything I wouldn't do for this person. Nothing. I would have stood in front of a freight train, and he hadn't done anything for me. He hadn't talked to me. He hadn't obeyed me. He didn't follow my rules. He just was. He just existed, and my entire being loved him with everything I had. Do you think in your remotest, most wild imaginations that I love better than God? I do not. In fact, my love for my son is only because I participate in their love. And he came as a man saying, if you'll know me. This is life. Life isn't something I give you as though it's like we have a relationship and okay, now that, you, now that you're talking to me and we have a relationship, I'll give you this gift called life. Being in relationship with him is life. He's life. He doesn't give it to you. He gives you himself. I want to follow that God. I want to know that God. I hope you do too. Because there's nothing, nothing more beautiful on the planet or in the cosmos or in existence. Okay? Thank you for time and I don't know what we do from here. Brad? Thanks. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you.